Good morning. I'm so excited to uh, present to you Brett Lott, a 15 book bestseller, book writer, and novelist, right? But no, not just a novelist, also nonfiction. Brett, yes. and uh, you live in the South, but you're from Southern California. So I feel like we are kindred spirits. And uh, just welcome to living a legacy life. I'm so glad I'm, you're here. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for for uh, opening up your, your time and your skills to uh, talk to little old me. Little old you, yeah. Um, you are currently a professor of English at the College of Charleston, and your novel, Jewel, the novel Jewel, if you haven't read it, was um, one of Oprah's book selection picks. A friend asked me the other day, how does that happen? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very interesting process. She actually, back then, uh, I can't speak for her now, but this was in the first iteration of it, mm -hmm. uh, the original, original Oprah's book club. And uh, she was famous for um, reading books all by herself. There, she had a policy that if you sent a book to her, you know, in the hopes that she's going to pick it for a club, she wasn't going to read it. She used to go down, she lived in, in Chicago and used to go down to her local books bookseller uh, there on the Miracle Mile there and kind of incognito go in and look at new books on the shelves and... Huh and think about those things and and read all kinds of books and um what what happened was that the long story is that uh when the book came out jewel came out and uh it came out in 1991 mm -hmm. fourth book and um she tried to uh she had just started her production company harpo productions and they were looking for properties and she tried to uh option it for a movie wow 1991 and but sally field had already optioned it at that point so so we knew that she had read it but she did not have this book club at that time and then oh. the years passed and uh published more books and um suddenly there was this book club thing that showed up and there were all the writers and editors and agents and everybody are just flipping out over this phenomenon oh, of she picks a book and it becomes an instant bestseller of course um, so um but you can't really do anything. You just kind of, okay, we knew that she'd read it. So then a friend of mine, another writer, published a story in Red Book Magazine back when Red Book used to publish oh. mainstream literature. Yeah. And uh, he said, have you seen the new copy of Red Book? And I said, no. And he says, it's the one with Oprah on the picture, on the cover. You might want to go look at it. Huh. And uh, so I went to the grocery store and I, there's Oprah on the cover and I opened up the article and there was a two page spread. And, um, She's standing in front of her desk with, you know, these Emmy awards that are there. And then there's a bookcase over here and there's maybe, you know, like 15 books on the bookcase. Mm -hmm. One of them is Jewel sitting there. And this is 1997 or 1998. This is years later. And there's this book still sitting on her bookcase. Wow. So then, uh, you know, so she selects it. The, the big question, the macro question is how she do it. She reads books and picks them. Hmm. And decides that that's what she wants to do and mine she had read earlier and yeah. then uh it was there in this picture uh and then a few months later um she tracked me down i was up teaching at uh, in vermont at, at a low residency mfa program at vermont college and um uh, got a phone call the, the the administrator got kind of a long story but got this phone call asking to speak to brett lott and I got on the phone and the guy says, um, is this Brett Lott? And I said, yes. And <laughs> he says, my boss would like to talk to you and put me on hold. And then the music that was playing on hold was I'm Every Woman, <laughs> Shaka Khan, which is, was Oprah's theme song. And I'm like, this is, this is strange. <laughs> and this voice comes on the phone and says, Brett, this is Oprah. We're going to have so much fun. Oh, wow. And it really, you know, changed changed so very much but yeah. it was an interesting thing because i published four more books since then mm -hmm. and um i was you know i was tremendously excited but i had to reread the book because you know i'd like done four right. more lifetimes you know books are you're consumed with your your sure. imagination and you know your life with the next book that you're writing that i had to I had to sit and reread the whole thing. I knew the book, but I had to reread it in case, you know, somebody asked me a point blank question. I wouldn't mm -hmm. go, what are you talking about? I have mm -hmm. no idea. Yeah, right. I, I understand that. And uh, what a huge blessing for you. And I, yeah. when I reread it, 
recently, I thought, wow, he uses the word nigger. I wonder how that, uh, how that kind of a trigger response in Oprah even. Uh, well, you know, there was a conversation that was had and, and uh, she, we had this conversation about the use of that word mm -hmm. and um, her friend Gail. Yes. <laughs> it was Gail, you know, Gail King, I think it is. Mm -hmm. it's Gail um, said she did not like it being oh. in the book. And Oprah yeah. said, well, why not? She said, because it's a <clears throat> word. And, um, but Oprah said, but it's a real word. It's the word that was used as yeah. a word. And, and that's why I used that word. And um, because it was, it was historically accurate, but not just accurate, but in the book, that word becomes a, a kind of, um, it's a, it's a, it's a strange sort of motif, so to speak, in that jewel when she hear it's it's about you know a woman who has six children and the sixth child and they, it's, a, it's in backwoods mississippi the sixth child is a down syndrome baby and um at that time they called a down syndrome children mongoloid idiots yeah and um and she refuses that word she says you cannot use that term you can't this is my baby you're, you're not right. going to but yet she'll use the the N word, yeah, at you know with black <laughs> people, and then it becomes this this way that she realizes I'm blind. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I I, I want to make sure everybody doesn't call my daughter this, but I'm the blind one here by using this word. And when she gets to Los Angeles, she learns the difference between the two and the respect that that was not being given to. The people that she, you know, she in fact loved and, and um, you know, dealt with her whole life back in Mississippi. And so it becomes a, it, it wasn't just a, a word choice to be accurate. It was a word choice that also spoke to um, one of the great themes, not great themes, you know what I'm saying? One of the yes. larger themes yeah. of the book is how do we look at people and assume what they are and call them what we do? Mm hmm so it's right. A, and that whole time when they go back to Mississippi mm -hmm. and how they go back into that, because that's yeah. what's expected. And then the transformation of her husband. I mean, people will just have to read it. I mean, we can't spend the whole time <laughs> just on this book, but it was beautiful. And I did write you and say, stop making me cry. I um, <laughs> did you always want to be a writer? I think somebody yeah. I think there are a lot of my listeners are want to be writers. Yeah, um, I <laughs> did not. I wanted to be. A uh, park ranger. I grew up uh, from nine nine to sixteen. Lived in Phoenix, and I was in a Boy Scout troop that went backpacking every one weekend every month. And by backpacking, I mean we, you know, didn't just park the the station wagon and, and yeah. sleep sleeping bags next to the station. <clears throat> Hi. So I love the outdoors, um, and so I wanted to be a par a park ranger. I wanted to put you know ride on a horse. Literally, I wanted to ride a horse in a in a park. So uh, I went to my first year of freshman, uh, I went to Northern Arizona University okay. and, and to the forestry school. And <clears throat> uh, I realized forestry program there was, was training you for like forest yield and management with Georgia Pacific and Weyerhaeuser and things like this, rather than being a park ranger. ranger. Not at that time, this is in the seventies. That You could have gone to Humboldt. <laughs> they have that. Uh, you know, I think... I, I think I applied in Humboldt, but I, what we had been, we were back in California by this time, but all my friends were in Arizona. I wanted to go to Oh Arizona. yeah, of course. Um, and so, but what changed you from horseback riding in your, in your I brain real, to riding? I realized I wasn't going to get a job <laughs> as a park ranger unless my <clears throat> brother-in-law or my uncle back, that was back in the seventies. It was total nepotism back then. Yeah. So, uh, so I went back to California and I was a marine biology major my sophomore year because oh. I like going to the beach. I went to Cal State Long Beach, which is the the Harvard of the greater Long Beach area. Yes. So, so I went to Cal State Long Beach. Then I got a D in a physics course. I had to pass, I get a C or better in to maintain, to be in the, the marine biology major. And so they kicked me out of that major and I quit school and never got a D. I became an RC Cola salesman because my dad worked for RC and I thought, well, okay. I'll go into the family business. <clears throat> and, um did that for a year. And then I uh, thought I wanted to teach. I, I, I decided I would go back to Cal State Long Beach 
And um, at that time, I was uh, working at my church with the youth group. And I thought, I thought, oh, maybe I'll teach high school. So I, to get ready to get back at, into classes at Cal State, I took a, uh, at Golden West Community College, I took a one class I needed to, I knew I wanted to take a class that would have uh, assignments and, and deadlines and things like this to get back in the groove before right. I went back. Smart. And um, the only class that was open was a creative writing class. Oh my god! I took that on Tuesday nights and huh. I showed up in my RC uniform and um, <laughs> they wrote horrible things and just <laughs> terrible writing, but I had a lot of fun. So I went back to Cal State, my, what would have been my junior year. I taught at Marina High School student taught thinking I'm going to be a teacher, you know, I'll teach mm -hmm. high school. And I realized there's not a chance that I'm going to teach high school. That was, mm -hmm. that was work. It that was, was a lot. Of, I taught high school 10 years. So yeah, I know it's work It's work. And I, I appreciate you. You people <laughs> in the public schools are, are <clears throat> difficult. Heroes. So then I took another career writing class just because I needed another elective. And one day the teacher read a <clears throat> sentence of one of my stories to oh. the class. Wow. And he said, this is a writer's sentence. And I remember thinking that felt good. Do you so remember this? Do you remember the sentence? It was something like, um, it was about, uh, I had just gone backpacking up at, um, up at Tahoe. Mm -hmm. And I was writing a story about a guy who's going backpacking to Tahoe. <clears> and <throat> uh, he drives past on the way up there, drives past the station wagon. It's just crammed with stuff and the the sentence was something like uh, the station wagon was crammed with kids uh suitcases fishing poles kids and kids <clears throat> something like that to just kind of keep at it the yeah. number of kids that were in this vehicle <laughs> and it wasn't a particularly flashy or anything <clears throat> sentence but but in an undergrad class he apparently the teacher stood out to the teacher and that made me feel good and then Oh, not only that, when you emphasize that, then people can see the image. Yeah. And as as a yeah. writer, as a writer, that's what you that's the hope. That that's they're actually visualizing the movie by looking at words. Right. Right. And so that that was this moment of positive, you know, reinforcement. Mm -hmm. And uh, at a time when I was trying <clears throat> I was trying every different major I could think of because uh, you know, I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um so he took he took me under his wing and, and, you know, got me to think about graduate school and got me to think about journals and, and writing. And, but so then I went off to grad school, but the, but the other part of this whole story is that uh, about wanting to be a writer. I did not want to be a writer. I read books my whole life. I read books all the time. And I look at that as having been the greatest um, contributor to the, to the whole deal. I, <clears throat> I read my brains out. I read, I read stuff. I read, you know, um, I was telling my wife, uh, oh, I, yeah, I read uh, Papillon when I was about 13. Papillon wow. is, is an autobiography of, of the guy, this, one of the only people who escaped Devil's Island. And it's like 900 pages. And, and I read that. I read uh, Deliverance. Wow. Like James <clears throat> Dickey when I was 16. I, and I, but it was just, I was laying my hands on everything from, from, you know, Dr. Seuss on up. I read the encyclopedia for fun. I remember sitting in my room reading encyclopedias for fun. So that um, facility <laughs> with words that's necessary for a writer, for me, came osmotically to because I was reading things mm -hmm. rather than thinking. I never sat and looked at a book jacket at the author photo and thought, oh, I want that to be. <clears throat> I never, never felt that. I was always like, what's a story? What's happening? Who are these mm -hmm. people? Mm -hmm. So I think that helped me not put the cart before the horse. That is, the story is more important than me, always, always. Mm -hmm. And um, that What is do you think? Do you... um? What's the favorite book that you've written, fiction or non? <clears throat> Me that I have written? Mm -hmm. um, I, that's like saying, you know, who's your favorite child? <laughs> we Sorry. know, we all know mom and dad have a favorite child. <laughs> but they're not allowed to say. Sorry. No, mm -hmm. I would say Jewel. Okay. Because uh, it was as, not because it was as successful as it was. What makes me think of that as my favorite is that 
it's based on the life of my grandmother who had six children who were mm -hmm. born in a cabin that my grandfather built in Mississippi. And the sixth one was Down syndrome. And wow. I grew up with that family where they were <clears throat> down to beach when I, when I was finally born out in California. Um, every weekend we spent at their house, a uh, little, little tiny little bungalow uh, mm -hmm. up to a railroad track. And um, just like in the book, always come, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and, uh, you, you, um, you're given what you're given in life. And we all, we all read books and we all think, Oh, they're so exotic. You know, we read novels that are here and there and that stuff, but to the writer, more often than not, those are just, those are just torn from their lives. They mm -hmm. use their own lives. And mm -hmm. yet, They've made it vivid enough to make it seem like, oh, it's some other world, other terrain. Um, my grandmother <clears throat> was this, was a very important figure in all our lives. And my aunt was very important, too. I grew up learning how, I think this has something to do with, be, with becoming a writer, too, or just a sensibility, I think. Writers are people who notice things. They pay attention to the mm -hmm. world. And we grew up with my aunt, who's Down syndrome, who was an adult. And we would, on the weekends, we'd go to bowling tournaments, her league, <clears> we'd go <throat> shopping, we'd go do stuff, and we'd stay at the house. And it just, there, there comes with that, with that being raised in that, a greater awareness of people around you when you go places and do things and how how people react to <clears throat> person with down syndrome and if you're in the i don't want to say the inner circle but if you're a loved one you're part of this thing you're paying much more attention to the outside world and i i think that that contributes to being a writer is paying attention to the outside world but why does than... why does someone with down syndrome pay attention to the outside world more no me than... as a kid you being... watching other people's response to your yeah aunt. yeah yeah, um, yeah. And well, I think were, dad, you my worried, dad were you worried that they would um yeah that was my aunt you know just yeah. to be yeah to be, be nice you, you would encounter that you <clears> encounter <throat> people who were rude or, yeah. or just didn't know how to be be um right my dad told told me stories about how each one of them there were six kids and and all five of them would measure the viability of a boyfriend or girlfriend by bringing them home yeah how do they treat our sister Mm -hmm. you know how to behave, behave i don't want to say behave but you know do you sure. know how to absolutely treat them well or to <clears throat> treat them like they're a strange animal or, or what and that would tell them you know what what is the viability of this person yeah i love that a, a, a and that's true person. and that's true with all families because we all have maybe not as much as the down syndrome but we all have something that we hope people are sympathetic towards or empathetic that's right. that's towards right. and and not hurtful yeah. uh, especially as believers but yeah. Unless we experience it like you have, we don't have the same empathic uh, yeah. vibe unless we really look at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. Do you think it's yeah. harder to write fiction than nonfiction? <clears throat> um, that's a good question. Um, I like writing. I, I've written fiction of, of my 15 books. Uh, you know, uh, 12 of them are fiction. So... Um, I fiction has come e more easily than nonfiction. Mm -hmm. three, I have three books <clears throat> that are nonfiction. I'm trying to count them in my head. Anyway, three books. No, this is the fourth one. This new one is fourth one. So there's eleven fiction <clears throat> and four nonfiction. Yeah, but I like. I'm finding as I, the older I get, the more I'm enjoying writing nonfiction. Because because um, it's it's a question of when you when you're writing fiction, a guy walks out the front door of the house, <clears throat> goes down the steps, and the front you know walks down to the end of the into the into the sidewalk. You know, it's it's one novel if he turns to the right, and it's another novel if he turns to the left. Hmm. You know, there's all the options in the world are available. Um, but in nonfiction, you're telling the story of walking down to the end of the in the end of the uh, the step the the little walkway there and onto the sidewalk and turning right and saying well why did i turn right which is to me that's it's a little more it's more i'm just more interested in wondering why 
I have done and the people I know have done what they have done, hmm. where they've been and what they've what they've thought about those things. Whereas fiction is is fiction is is extraordinary in terms of what it can do with your imagination. And I still love reading fiction more than anything else. Um, but there comes a point where, and I'm getting older, where <clears throat> the idea of making everything up is just it's it's sort of daunting. And I and I've got to the point where I'm like, I want to figure out why I've done the things that I've done, and mm -hmm. and people I know, and and mm -hmm. and what we did while we were there, hmm. you know, what we were thinking. I think that's I, a good question. Go ahead. I have I have a friend who um, doesn't read. We're both the same enneagram, which means nothing. But she goes, oh, I don't I don't read fiction because as soon as I start, I go, well, this didn't really happen. Whereas I yeah. almost always only read fiction, which makes me, I know people judge me, but uh, so when I find a good fiction, I go, oh, good, Some, you know, something that's worthwhile that I can sink my teeth into or that I'm just entertained by. Yeah. Whereas if it's, I have very few books that I've thoroughly enjoyed as much as a good fiction book. Maybe Soul, I agree. Keep, I Soul, agree. Keeping, Soul Keeping by John Ortberg. I could have started that over at the beginning and read it a yeah. second time. I don't know if you've read that. No. Uh, very and uh, but then I read Peace Like a River over and over. Have you huh. read that? Yes. yes. Yeah. It's so great. Uh, sobbed. I remember just sitting and sobbing. Sobbing, <laughs> sobbing at the end of that book. Just literally <laughs> yeah. just crying reading that reading the end of that book. That cracks me up. And then also, um, I don't know, I'm not a fi uh, science fiction reader, uh -huh. but my sister insisted I read Connie Willis. Have you uh -huh. read her? No. I'm going to send you all the names of her books, just three, because yeah. I sobbed at the end of those. Really? Uh, it was Sounds time travel. It was time travel and Oxford uh, based. But uh, the first one is Doomsday Book. Read it first and then <clears throat> Blackout, which is World War II, and then All Clear World War II. And those go right together. So buy them so that you have to go really usually when there's a next book, you can wait a little bit. This one, it goes into the next sentence. So have them both on yeah. hand. Wow. If you can't find them, I'll send you my copies. But I keep giving mine away. So all clear, I'll find back him. I'll out, him. and I wept, and I wrote in the margins, I'm weeping here. So, um, yeah, a good fiction book is what I'm all about. So um, I, well, I, you, I have, you have a new I'm, book coming out this month. Can you tell us about that one? The um, non this is nonfiction. This is a book <clears throat> called Gather the Olives. Gather the Olives, um, okay. It's from Slant Books. It's um, nonfiction. Uh, my wife and I lived in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. Um, while I was a visiting professor at Bar Ilan University in Tel Aviv, but we Wonderful. said we wanted to live in Jerusalem. So we <clears> lived <throat> in Jerusalem, like a 10 minute walk to the old city. Wow. And, um, then we have over the years since then been uh, there several times, many times, uh, for longer periods of time than normal, just because we were, we were guests of the State Department and um, bar -Lan University. But it's about <clears throat> food. It's about how we go over there. And and the community was always food, which is like everywhere. But mm -hmm. but we just encountered very beautiful people, both both is Israelis and Palestinians alike. And uh, we, we visited um, just up and down everywhere in Israel. We also went to Ramallah. We went to the West Bank. We went to um, you know, plenty of places where there are always beautiful people. And we, um, I turned the book in a couple months before October 7th. Wow. And uh, it kind of, which just blew things up. And um, <clears throat> what do you hope for the readers to get from your book? I hope that people will read that, that the, the Holy Land is filled with people who um, are, peace-loving people what we see on the news is not the all of everything that happens there mm -hmm. it's a story it's i had to rewrite i had to write an, an intro for it that after i turned it in i turned it in and then had to write an acknowledgement of wow. the way that it is now and and i just want people to know and wrote in the intro that this is about people with people and it's not about social justice it's not a, about political uh statehood one state two state it's not about 
um, retribution. It's not about war. It's not about any of the things that we see that just kind of explode on, our, <clears throat> on our television all the time. It's about how it's about people and how food brings people together and and um, the peace that's that's knowable. And mm. it's about the hope that will not disappear. Hope isn't going to disappear. Hope no. doesn't end. It doesn't right. fade. And that's what I'm trying to say in this book. And is, uh, Brett, you volunteered uh, to give away one of the yes. this week. So if I'm you make a call. Sign and send. Oh, uh, baby. This is, it's going to be in hardback. This is the uh, advanced reader's copy. So it will be in hardback. So I will Thank sign you so and much. Send. Thank you so much. Because that's perfect. Um, <clears throat> do you write to change lives or to entertain? Um, I don't, I, I write, here's why I write. I write cause I don't, I don't understand things. I want to, I see a story. I see something happen and, and I write a story to try and figure <clears throat> out what happened. Wow. I don't want, I don't understand how things work. And, uh, Flannery O'Connor, uh, one of my heroes, Flannery O'Connor said fiction writers, have to retain a grain of stupidity of mm. not getting things. <clears throat> what that means is you have to look at things and say, how does that work? Huh. Understand. Well, I've been teaching now for 40 years. I'm retiring next year. Mm, congratulations. Immediately, the students, the students that I, I know <clears throat> are going to be a problem. Are the students who come in and are, are like, I know how the world works. And I'm going to tell you, this is like, I don't want to hear from that person. All right. I want to hear from somebody who says, I don't know how this thing works. Hmm. But I'm going to try and understand it by telling a story about it. Hmm. And um, that's yeah. why I write. I write because I don't quite understand. And in this new, the new book, Gather the Elves, it was, um, there was an essay in there about <clears throat> the really strange thing that happened. And that was that one time, uh, we were over there. I was over there with the State Department doing a program, and we they had a uh, Israel had a minor league baseball team, and uh, there it was filled with people from Colombia and Mexico and <laughs> United States and Japan, and all these people were coming. You know, this so, but it was in the middle of nowhere. The game we went to was in the middle of nowhere, in, in like a, a sunflower field, but it was like a high school baseball diamond. It was just the first year um of this league and um i was sitting there with these colleagues from the state department we were having <clears throat> we were just having sandwiches from a food truck and they have what um birthright i don't know if you know birthright but there's a whole program in israel where if you're an american and you're 18 to whatever they'll pay for you to come to israel and go on these big tours and there's buses that drive all over the place uh, and just to, you know, to get you acquainted with Israel in the hope that one day you will, you will, you know, emigrate there. So, um, do you have, sitting, to, be, do you have then, to be Jewish to do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You didn't mention that. No <laughs> Baptists allowed. So, <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, and we're sitting there and this, this birthright tour comes and this big old boss and they all get out. And uh, they go to the food truck and these kids got food and then they're sitting at the table right behind us. And this is just a high school baseball diamond. Okay. So we're sitting at these like Kmart level plastic chairs and tables. And um, we're just shooting the breeze with our colleagues. And then this girl behind me says, "You are you guys American? I said, yes. And she starts asking where we're from and all her friends at the table. And um, she I, you know, came my turn and I said, I'm uh, from Charleston, South Carolina. And she goes, Charleston, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a teacher. And she said, where? At the College of Charleston. What's your name? Um, uh -huh. It's Brett Lott. She goes, Brett Lott, I'm trying to get into your class. Will you give me an override? And it's some freshman from New Jersey, okay, who, who wasn't even at the college yet. She was a senior was going to start in college. Wow. And I, and I, the thing is that I wanted to understand how in the world does that happen? Right. I don't know how that happens. Mm -hmm. And that's what the essay is about. Yeah. And that happens, happens. that happens a lot, but you just never it know. Does. There's it nothing, does. nothing random. I like about. to say there's nothing random in God's economy, but there's nothing random. No, no coincidence. It sounds a little hackneyed, but I still like it. 
Yeah, um, so what's the difference so between what's the difference between bad writing, inspired, unforgettable writing? Bad, inspired, and unforgettable, or forgettable? Let's say bad writing versus inspired, or okay. unforgettable bad versus bad writing. Bad writing, I think, says <laughs> I have something to tell you, and I'm going to tell you. Oh, bad writing is writing that's aware it's writing. That's another thing. I'm mm -hmm. writing this. Bad writing is using too many words. <laughs> Inspired writing is, is when the author leaves the room and the author isn't there and the story is just being told. That's good writing. That's inspiring. Wow. Bad writing is when the author gets in the way. I, I heard a sermon at our, our church a few years ago. I'm always, actually, it's probably 20 years ago now. I'm old. Um, and the, the, he was a guest ser guest pastor's, you know, guest sermon. And he, that's always dicey. You know yes, what I mean? Yes. I was yes. like, wait a minute. I, I know my pastor. Yeah. Okay, we'll do it this <laughs> Sunday. Uh, so, but this guy was great. And he said, um, just one of his lines was, the last person I need to hear from is me. Mm. And that, that just, it just struck me. It's like, wow. And I think that inspired writing is not you. Hmm. I don't want to hear from you. I want to hear the story. And when I get in the way of the story that it, you're starting to hear from me. Hmm. And I'm, 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 an, I'm a, a, a vessel. I'm a, a, the amanuensis. Hmm. The amanuensis is the person <laughs> who uh, at the oracles at Delphi, the amanuensis was the one writing down all the things that the oracle said. Hmm. That's my job. I'm not the oracle. And I think yeah. bad writing is when the writer thinks they're the oracle. I feel and the same way about speaking, Brett, when I go to speak that I'm the conduit of the, the whole conduit, spirit. Exactly, exactly. And, if, and, and if I'm not, then it won't last forever. If I am, it's the Holy Spirit working in and I don't really want, I mean, I always like to be affirmed because then you think, well, maybe I shouldn't be speaking if no one likes me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if they go on and on, it's like, wait, wait, not that they do, but if they do, I want to make sure that Christ is there and you want to make sure the story is there. At the end of Jewel, I think it ended with smiling, smiling, smiling. And I thought, okay, what does that actually mean? But I kept waiting for that to come around because that was the prophecy that was given over Jewel's life. And I thought, okay, that, that kind of makes sense to me. And the, some of the story lasted with me and not the name Brett Lott, if that makes you feel any better. No, that's exactly what I want. Yeah, of course. That's what I want. I don't matter. I, here, here, what happened for me when I first started writing was, um, although I didn't want to be a writer, I all of a sudden I was taking these classes at, at the university, and um, all they do is talk about the author, you know? Hmm. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe the author is the person. So I started writing thinking that when I first started writing, I was thinking that this is like, look at what a good writer I am. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I couldn't turn around without a met metaphor or simile. Every sentence had to have a metaphor or <laughs> simile. And uh, because that's what they talked mm -hmm. about. Oh, mm -hmm. the metaphors here. Oh, the simile. Oh, the themes. Oh, the symbols. <laughs> you know, all those those rhetorical devices are what ta are talked about uh, in oftentimes in in uh, literature courses when those are organic to the story. They come out of the story in good work. Mm -hmm. But I thought that that's what it was. And then I went off to grad school, went to UMass Amherst, and I still was under the belief that, uh, you know, it was all about me and how well I wrote. And I promptly got um, everything that I turned <laughs> in that first semester as a, as a grad student was just destroyed by the the the, the teacher and the students, the grad students in the workshop. They just wow. destroyed everything. <clears throat> and uh, at the end of the semester, we'd moved all the way from Los Angeles to taking out student loans. And we were married by that time. Um, and we, um, I, at the, the last workshop, the professor says, hey, everybody, great semester. See you in the spring. Brett, come with me. And I went to him to his office. He sat me down and said, Brett, and I've committed this to memory. He said, Brett, I see no reason why you shouldn't be here, why you shouldn't be in our program, but I see no reason why you should. Wow. 
And um, I, I went home and said to Melanie, you know, hey, pack it up. We're going. This thing wow. is, I don't have it. <clears throat> and uh, she said, ah, oh, that guy's crazy. Let's stay here for another semester. And um, we did. But during that winter break, I read stories by a writer named Raymond Carver, who, whose writing was, he only wrote short stories and and his stories were about people in dire circumstance, mm. but there was never you, you there. There just wasn't any room for a metaphor or simile. It mm. did. They, they, these are real people. A metaphor and a simile are bling. You know, they're mm -hmm. they're optional equipment. You know, but these lives are so in peril. But usually, alcohol and alcoholism at the root of it. Uh, that there was nothing like a simile or a metaphor and. I really just realized that the author is the last person that you want to hear from. I'm the last person I want to hear from. Huh. And I read, I started a new story that over that winter break and <clears> I turned <throat> in and it was based on something that happened to my older brother and myself. And then I asked myself, well, what if, you know, two thirds of the way through what really happened? What if that happened? Hmm. And, um, I turned it in and, and, um, I published my stories with the name R. R. Brettley Lott, which I thought would look really good in the New Yorker. At the end of the That's what I thought. My name is Robert Brettley Lott. Nobody's ever called me R. or Brettley. <laughs> so um, I forgot to type my name at the top of the page and I was turning it in for class. And I was like, oh, I got to do this. I just roll it in and I typed up Brett Lott at the top which is the only name I've ever gone gone by. And I typed that in and it was really, <clears throat> if light bulbs go off over your head, there was a light bulb that went off over my head. It said, hmm. you're not our Brettley. You are a dude named Brett Lott. And this That's is who you are. And this is who you are. And he liked that one. Yeah. and it, Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything changed after that. That was the beginning. That was the first real story I ended up writing. Hmm. My English teacher, um, probably third year college, he, he finally liked one of my stories and it was based on a true story because I was a cheerleader and I was a terrible cheerleader, but I got knocked out by another cheerleader with his elbow. Really? I woke up, I was sitting on the bench and wondering, I don't think I can actually do any cheerleading. And I wrote yeah. about that. And he goes yeah. like, finally, Sue, you're writing real stuff. And yeah. uh, it, and not that I am Brett Lott, but I just thought that's what people want. They want the bare bones. People just put, they tell you too much. I mean, I read Christian writing and I just can't stomach it. And so I feel like I shouldn't say that for everybody, but uh, okay. I, I like Jan Karen. I really like yeah. Jan Karen, and not everybody does, but I thought she was great. I read all her books many times. She's a great writer. And you she, know what? She had real people. Real people. Yeah. And I wish she would keep writing, but maybe she doesn't need to anymore. But um, so I really appreciated your book on Ruth and Naomi. It really was a story of Naomi. I thought it was going to be a story of Ruth. And it was so creative. It took me a while to get into it, I have to say, because I thought, oh, this is just going to be another, you know, why would they bother redoing a, a a wonderful Bible story. Well, it was fabulous. And I sort of lost that whole thought when I got lost into the language. I'm fascinated with how you get into colloquial language and the time periods of American history. But most of all, I'm floored by how you can get into a woman's emotions. I mean, Melanie must be a really patient woman and tell you uh, everything that she feels. Very patient. Very patient. Here, <laughs> here's the story about Melanie. So I was taking that creative writing class, the very first one at, at Golden West when I was an R.C. Cole salesman. And I met Melanie. I met her in Sunday school. Mm -hmm. in our college group and um i was taking this creative writing class and we had dated like two times mm -hmm. and i thought i'm gonna impress her and so i gave her a short story that i'd written for that class at golden west and uh i was renting a house of three other guys we were in huntington beach and she was <clears> a few blocks away um uh, so i gave it to her to read i was gonna i'm gonna impress her and uh, she read it and came over to the house and we had this cheap dinette set in this little <laughs> kind of easy area. It was an old house in Huntington Beach. And uh, we were standing there. And I said, so what did you think? <laughs> she, took the story. she took the story and just kind of went, hmm, oh. tossed it on that dinette table. She just tossed it on there and she went. <laughs> Shook her head. 
Yeah. And, wow. um, uh, and I remember do, I do remember thinking <clears throat> I may love her. Oh, because she, she was honest. Absolutely honest with me. Yeah. I think and, I may love um, <laughs> So I ask Melanie, as you know, when I'm writing, uh, is when I was writing these books from these points of view, I asked her a million questions. Yeah. You know, and the questions, though, the the thing, the, the if there's a secret, there's no secret. It's just the way I I understood it was, you're not writing about a woman. You're writing about a person hmm. who is a woman. <clears throat> that's the most important thing. I, I I would absolutely fail if I if I made up a character and said, well, now what would women do? Hmm. Now, sometimes there is a correct answer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it doesn't matter. It's going to be <clears throat> who is that person? Hmm. She was born then. She was born there. She had this many siblings. I you you work all those <clears throat> things out when you're writing the book. You kind of figure out what is the story of these people. So that you're writing about a particular person on the face of the earth and not women. Why so, do you think it's important to practice art? <clears throat> it's important to practice art because, uh, well, art is many things. Okay. My immediate answer was going to be because God made us in his image mm -hmm. and he's a creator. He, <clears throat> he made us to make things. So there's art all over the place. It's about creation, making things. But art in our in our worldly terms of art, a human being is a work of art. A, mm -hmm. a life is a work of art. All those, you know, those things that are easy to say. But in terms of writing a book or making a, a painting or composing <clears throat> music or performing, um, I think those are all manifestations of who God is. Mm -hmm. You know, and the the best art I think is not is not work that is didactic or utilitarian it fills us with wonder and glory and beauty and joy and mystery that's what great art does and because we want that because that's what god those are those are all <clears throat> attributes of god and it doesn't say that by creating i create god but by creating making art i am re reflecting that gift that we all have that God's imbued in our lives. Mm -hmm. He's made us to be makers. <clears throat> he's blessed us to be person. blessings. He's, he's, you know, and it gives him great joy. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. Sadly, one of the, one of the problems of, of, um, and I say this as a Protestant, I'm, I'm a, I attend the Southern Baptist church, uh, and happily so. And my pastor's like, I, we we can't stand when we have a guest pastor. <laughs> um, so um, when at that at that church, the 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 problem with with evangelical orientation toward art is, and this is a broad statement, but it's I'm going to make it anyway, is that <clears throat> Protestants evangelicals look at stuff as as it must be a utility. It's got to be utility. Mm. It's got to be purpose. It's got to bring folks to the Lord and it's got to pointedly do that. Hmm. And in there's, there's the Catholics have it all over us in terms of their understanding of making something beautiful. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, I agree there and <clears throat> beauty is a good, it is a good thing. It is a necessary thing. Um, there's a wonderful book right here called Art in the Bible, our good oh, friend Francis wow. Schaefer, the classic. <clears throat> he talks about in there how in the Bible, when they're making, you know, they he identifies, uh, God identifies Bezalel as the, the dude who's going to make the, the tabernacle. He's going to make the Ark of the Covenant. He's going to make the, the draperies. He's going to make the, the, the clothing, the, you know, for the priests and everything. And But he makes a point in there of how there's all these lines when he says you're going to make it for beauty. Mm -hmm. It's like why are there why is there a pomegranate and a bell? A pomegranate and a bell. What what is that? What utility is a pomegranate and a bell? A bell might have some utility in terms of when you go into the holy holies, but but also there's um, he makes a point of uh, God says okay you're going to make pomegranates and they're going to be blue, mm -hmm. and that's in the Bible. And it's like. <clears throat> 
but they're rich. It's a blue pomegranate. It's <laughs> for beauty. Mm -hmm. you know? And those pillars, those giant pillars that get made, they have names. You know, what is the point? They put the mm. capital at the top and it says it's going to have this network up there for beauty, mm. not a utility. Yeah. And uh, so. Well, I feel that way about a good line of writing. And that's what you do, Brett. I agree. Uh, you know, this is a podcast. I agree about... with you about how that's what I think of when I think. Of <laughs> no, 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 no. I understood what you meant. Don't worry. Okay. Um, you know, this is a podcast about legacy. Yes. And uh, what legacy do you want to be sure that you leave for those who know and love you? <clears throat> uh, okay. So, um, you know, legacy. I don't think a whole lot about that because I think that. <clears throat> My, I'm not saying, I'm not discounting this. I do think about it. But first and foremost is what am I doing now with my work? That's that, always the most important That's thing. my second and question. I think that that's what the legacy should be. Absolutely. You know? When he was here, he was doing what God had called him to do. He was doing this work. That's the legacy. I don't think people, I just commented on Facebook. Somebody <clears throat> posted a review of a, a poet it was a review in the New York Times of a poet who died 25 years ago who was famous, Anthony Hecht. And um, they just published his posthumous, posthumous works and a biography of him. And this review in the New York Times just kind of trashed <clears throat> the, the, the work, the po biography, and the man. Wow. And I commented on Facebook that, you know, would would that any of us <clears throat> we're having 25 years after we were dead our, our work posthumously collected a biography written hmm. even being thought about by people 25 years from now i'm not under any kind of delusion that people were talking about my art but my grandkids and great grandkids may end up knowing you know that grandpa did these things and he did these and you know in trying to serve the lord and trying to make something true and good and beautiful that's when the legacy lies mm -hmm. well this is why i started this because i had heard of a friend's saying that his mother had started with uh, some early dementia not that uh -huh. early and i said how old how old is she and he said um 87 and i mm -hmm. at the time i was 66 and i thought oh well i only have 21 more years of cognitive viability where i can even pronounce cognitive viability much less mm -hmm. spell it much less mm -hmm. do it so i started interviewing friends of mine who were a little older and saying what is your legacy what is your legacy and what are you doing about it right now well i kind of knew because i knew them as quality people you work on it now what you mm -hmm. said was exactly why i do it because people think oh that's something to do to make sure it happens after i die yeah. no you do today because if you invest in people or in the word of god then those two things last forever yeah. So the fact that you're writing fiction is investing in people because we I, we identify with that person. We're sobbing at the end of the novel or we're laughing out loud. And my husband's going, what are you laughing about? Never mind. I'm in the middle of this book, you know, because he's watching the news. And so we're different people and different things are attracted to different things. So how you're doing it now is that you're writing. What challenges did you have to face to make sure it happened? I think you explained that. Did you want to add anything else? No. <clears throat> okay. No. And I'm, what do you want to do after oh, you retire? You say you're going to retire. You say you're old, but I'm older. So you can't say you're going to retire. You're just going to retread. And yes. uh, that's my pastor said, who I also like as well. And he'll say, well, you don't really retire. You retread and you just do something else that God's been, want, been right. preparing you for. Right. So will you lead trips to, is to uh, Israel? Because I'll go. No, I'm leading trips to Italy is what our plan is. Well, we, I'll go we, to that we, one too. <laughs> okay. okay. Let we, me know. Uh, my wife and I have started this started a uh, a thing that we've thought about for many years for for the last 15 years i've been bringing students from the college of charleston where i teach to italy for summer programs of writing oh. and um we as we were headed to retirement we and people have just urged us to do this for years and my wife has said we need to do this for many years hmm. uh, but we decided you know what we're going to start um doing retreats in italy writing retreats and uh, we'll, wow. we'll, in the mornings, we will do writing and talk and work and stuff. And then <laughs> in the afternoons, uh, we, we'll be going to, you know, cooking class. We're going to wine <clears throat> tastings. We're going to 
you know, historic sites and things like this. And then, um, you know, in the evenings have little sessions and, and, uh, but that's for, we're, we're doing it first, first session is in October, third week of October. Hmm. And, um, it's full. We put, we put this thing up in the beginning of December within a month, we were totally full. Hmm. So we, we hope we can do this once or twice a year as we go forward because uh, Italy is a beautiful, beautiful and very inspiring place. And um, <clears throat> I love it there. Um, I'm reading John Grisham, The Broker, right now, and it's set in Italy. So I'm oh, yeah? in that. I will well. have to read it. Where yeah. is it set? Uh, is well, he's going all over because he's hiding okay. from the CIA. So it's uh, Siena, maybe. Uh-huh. Um, I was Milan. just there last week. I was just in Siena last week. Oh my goodness! So okay. that's so. If people want to do that in the future, how do they find that? Just brettlot.com. They would go to brettlotwriting. Okay. Um, brettlotwriting.com. Okay. And how does your life embody the welcoming heart of God by doing retreats? Um, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know how how to answer that. Um. Doing these retreats, but also trying to be a good teacher mm-hmm. who is encouraging and um, just helping students to write well and write as well as they can. And they know that I'm a Christian and mm-hmm. I bring that point of view, that, that idea that uh, art is redemptive. It's not that it's a, that you have to have a come to uh, Jesus scenes. It's just that Art is a redemptive act, mm. and it's my job to help my students find how best to tell stories that are true and good and beautiful. So that's how that is. But I also play the uh, baritone saxophone in our orchestra at church. <laughs> and, I played uh, the alto sax in eighth grade. Do you really? Uh, okay, that's great. Uh, <laughs> Baritone's uh, too big for me. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but, that's uh, funny. Well, I think this has been a beautiful discussion of art. And I, our pastor likes to do um, in the summer, we're not really a seeker church, but in the summer, he switches to Real Grace. Our church is called Grace and it's R-E-E-L. So he chooses a movie, a current movie, and yeah. finds all the redemptive parts of it. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of hard to find them nowadays that aren't too, you know, that you couldn't show to family. But the whole idea is what you said, that we are here to... Um, redeem what what we can and it's only through the power of the spirit and a creative act so what a blessing you've been and thank you so much and follow brett lot on brettlotwriting.com as well as make a comment and you'll get the name tell us the name of the book again please the new one i'll gather the olives gather the olives and it's on food and did you have a recipe you wanted to share as well you want to send that to me um i can send that to you sure okay um, we'll publish be, it. what's that we'll publish it in show notes okay very good Thank you so much. Thank Thank you so much. It's been a delight.